Welcome to church. We're really glad you decided to join us today. Here at Pathway, we are a family of individuals who have found life in Jesus Christ and simply want as many people as possible to experience that exact same thing. Our church is made up of imperfect people with every kind of story imaginable. No matter where you are or what you've been through, we hope our church is a place where you'll find the love, grace, and forgiveness Jesus offers to everyone. So come as you are. At the end of the day, we're all about journeying together in life as we pursue wholeness in Christ. Welcome to Pathway Community Church. Hey everyone, I'm Tanisha. Welcome to Pathway Online. Today we're going to be continuing our witness series and our guest speaker today is Riley Smith, which is awesome. So let's start off with the day with some worship. Come on and join us.
got some announcements for you guys. First one is our Mops group is having a game night this Monday, August 16th, 7 p.m. at the Youth Room. It is for any mom that has kids from zero to five, and it's free, it's gonna be games, it's gonna be fun. We'd love to have you there, come on out. Our second announcement is that we have another women's event coming up. It's on August 30th. It's gonna be a women's fire night for women only, and you can sign up on the Church Center app. And lastly, I wanna mention that if you'd like to partner with us financially, and give, there's a couple ways that you can do that, either in person or online. For more information and assistance on that, visit pathwaycc.net slash give. Hey Pathway and guests, it is an honor to be able to share the word with you today. My name is Riley Smith, a last name that is very common in the wider world, but not here in Winkler. Um, but I'm just going to jump right into it today. Well, let's get started on this adventure in Colossians 3.16. Now, right away I'm going to remark on something that Pastor Rob always says. He says, if you don't know where the book of Colossians is, at the beginning of your Bible, you got a table of contents. People worked really hard to put it there, just don't be ashamed to use it. One, I want to reiterate that point. But I also want to note how he makes that point every sermon. Because it does something that I think is really important and plays into what we are going to read about in Colossians 3, 16 to 17 and other places. So please remember that line, though I'm sure if you've listened to many of Rob's sermons, you've already have it memorized. And we'll get back to that later. This passage doesn't need any introduction, um, but I encourage you to just jump in with me, Colossians 3, 16 to 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I just invite you to pray with me now. Father, we are grateful for the gift that you have given us of salvation, for the good news, for sending Christ to us. And we're grateful to you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you have made I just ask as we go into this sermon that we would learn from your word that what you want um, everyone to take home, they would take home. Um, that if certain things would stick out in their minds that you want to stick out. And things that I say that are not of you, Lord, would just fade away. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, right at the start of the chosen passage, Paul uses the phrase, the word of Christ. Your translation may read the message of Christ. And the message of Christ is a reference to the gospel, the good news. Many of us have a basic understanding of what the gospel is, but I encourage you, if you don't, haven't already, listen to Pastor Andrew's message from last week entitled Gospel Defined. I think you'll find it really helpful at defining the gospel. Uh, Paul wants this message of Christ or gospel to dwell. That means live with us, be at home among us. Not a guest or a passerby in our lives, but someone or something who is always with us. But who is the you? Who is the us in this circumstance? Because I think it's important to note that the you that he uses is actually a plural you. He's referring to the whole church, in this case at Colossae, because it's the book of Colossians, not just the individual members. It isn't about us as individuals, as our actions, when he starts talking about this. It is about us as the church, as the whole you. So note that this isn't just about you. This is something we do as a whole. Every one of us plays a part in this together. Even though the word dwell already clearly designates that the gospel should be very common among us, Paul also wants to use the word richly or abundantly. It's not enough just for it to live with us, but it must be abundant, common, unsurprising as it dwells among us. But what does this look like? Paul goes on to share what it does look like. Paul describes it as with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. This is what it looks like in Paul's eyes when the gospel lives among us. Now, as any parent of a two-year-old knows, the logical next question is why? 
Why does the gospel living among us need to be shown in this way? For all the two-year-olds out there, we're going to answer this question. And I think it can help the rest of us along the way. There are at least four reasons why. And I think there can be others as well, but these are the four that I'm going to mention today. One, it's a natural outpouring of the message of Christ dwelling richly among us. This is what naturally happens when the gospel is being um, is dwelling among us. It naturally happens without us even having to think about or attempt to do it in any way. Number two, it is a natural reaction to the gift of salvation. So in this sense, when we see get given this, it's grace, this gift of salvation, this gift of Christ coming and sacrificing on our behalf that we didn't deserve. So when we react to that, our natural reaction is to also have grace outwards, to be thankful. Number three is it's commanded. I think there is often times where we come along stuff in our life where we don't understand why we should do that or we don't feel like we should. There are certain times when our natural inclination is not to love someone, but we know that it's commanded of us. And so that's another reason why it's commanded. And while all three of these are really important, it's actually the fourth one that I'm going to focus on the most today. And the fourth one is, by living out the gospel inside the church, others outside the church will come to know who Christ is and maybe even develop a personal relationship with him. To say this otherwise, what we do inside the church is a beacon to those outside the church. You think of Jesus' example of a city on a hill that can be seen for miles, or a lighthouse that towers above the waters and can be seen far away by any ships. However, another great example that I want to pull up is actually something for your kids. Because I think even though this sermon, even though this message, it's not designed to be for kids. But as an adult, if you have kids, if you have nieces and nephews who are Christians, who believe, they have some of the best chances of being a beacon, of being a light in their peers' lives and those other kids' lives, whether it's at swimming lessons, school, maybe a homeschool group. Maybe it's at Sunday school with kids who aren't Christians. These kids are often put in situations where they're meeting kids who don't believe, who don't have faith. And so a great way of describing this to them comes from a game called Minecraft. And it's a really popular game. I'm quite sure that your teen or your kid will have heard of it. And in that game, there's something called a beacon. It is hard to get in the game, but it is so worth it when you get it. Because it sends a light all the way up into the sky that even when it's dark at night in the game, you can see from far away where you live so you can make it back to a safe home. This is just like make it back to a safe home. This is just like the real world in the sense that the church can be a beacon of light and the world can be a dark place. Just like Minecraft, the world can be filled with monsters like greed, anger, jealousy, those sins. It can even just be the pain of losing loved ones. And it can be other people, how they treat us. And even at times, we can be the own monsters in our lives, our own foils. But the church can be a beacon to everyone, to provide solace, to provide hope, Let's turn to John 17, 20 to 21. A quick recap here. Jesus is praying for the disciples. But then he moves beyond that and asks his father the following. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. It is here Jesus expresses his prayer to the Father that everyone who believes in Jesus from the apostles preaching and teaching, aka all of us, would be one. 
This is a prayer that we can read that Jesus prayed about us. If you want to know what Jesus prays for you, here is one thing that we can look at and knows, know that he prays about for us. That we would be so tied together that we would be one even as Jesus and the Father are one. Now there is so much theological thought on the Trinity. There's been so much conversation over the last 2,000 years about how the Father and Son can be two and yet one. But nobody talks like that about the church. I've never heard anyone wonder about how we can be so united and yet all be separate people. And that's a big deal, but we'll get to that to another day. I want to focus on the reason that he wants this. He says, so that the world may believe that God the Father sent Jesus, aka that the gospel is true. His exact words are, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. How we act as the church affects how people see the gospel, how they see Jesus. Jesus himself ties this correlation for us. This is pretty basic stuff. In a world where we are 2,000 years removed from when Jesus was walking on the earth, it should be no surprise that we, both as the church and as individual Christians, represent to many people who Jesus is. We shouldn't need Jesus to spell it out for us, but he has. I have a group of friends, and we were all in the restaurant one day, and one of the group made an assertion which I very much disagreed with. And you know what I did? I did what I think many of us would do, but that I know that I often do with a close friend when I disagree. I really let them know that I disagree. And what came afterwards was an ever-escalating conversation. But it's important to note that my friend and I both felt very comfortable in this conversation. We were very tight-knit friends. We can say it like it is to each other, um, where I'm very tactful with most people. I'm not as much with him. Um, and we were very blunt with one another. So neither of us felt like we were out of line, and neither of us felt like we were hurting the relationship with the other person. It felt completely comfortable for us. And I would say we didn't hurt each other. We were just both very passionate people, and for us, for us, this is how we express that to each other. Because we trust and love one another and are in a close relationship. But our topic was something regarding church. So, remember the setting. We are in a restaurant. Everyone around us knew that we were some form of Christian because we were talking about something to do with church. And we proceeded to act in a way that did not appear composed, graceful, or filled with wisdom. Rather, we appeared upset, rowdy, and provocative. Our conversation was not wrong in the right setting. But to anyone outside of our group, it was not helpful or productive. One of our companions in the friend group pointed out part of our error. It was obvious to me and quite humbling that we had done wrong. Our conversation was 100% fine if it had happened between my friend and I at, at my house, at his house, or in a private setting. However, it was entirely lacking in grace and wisdom to have it at a public restaurant. Why? Because no one there found the actions of my friend and I to be attracting them to Christ. In fact, I would find it more believable that the other Christians who may have been in that restaurant at that time, that day, would have been regretting <laughs> that we were talking about church, that we were calling ourselves Christians. They would rather not be associated with us rather than others wanting to be associated with us. How we act as a church matters. And if you want to know more about that, then I encourage you to flip back to the Family Matters series. Because during that, Pathway really got into how we treat each other inside the church. But Paul doesn't just leave it at our interactions with each other inside the church. He continues on in Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I find there is always a temptation to hide behind the church as individuals. 
And what I mean by this, as a church, we have programs, whether it's Sunday morning service, youth groups, Sunday school, other small groups or teaching programs like Pathway at the Movies or whatever. There's a long list of things. And we can feel that as long as we both learn from these and help out in a couple, that is enough. And this is something that I struggle with too. I'm not coming at this saying, oh yeah, I am the best at this. Because you're going to point out times to me in my life, if you know me, and you're going to say, Riley, you're not doing good here. And it's, yeah, it's true. I'm not perfect at this either. We're all in this together. When we feel like whether consciously, but more often subconsciously, that we have done our part, and we can go home when we feel like it doesn't really matter if we don't treat our spouse, our kids, our parents, our friends, coworkers, employees, bosses, clerks, all the people that we run into consistently, the way that Christ would treat them. Because we've done our part. We've gone to Sunday school. We've gone to church. We've, you know, did our part serving at Sunday school and we did our part listening at church and, and now we're good to go. Or whether it's youth group or whatever it is. But the gospel was never designed to be segmented out that way. It's an all or nothing thing. As Paul points out, it's every word and deed. He even addresses what is often our one way out from a job well done. Which is really interesting that we take this one way out so often because we get so close to doing things right and then we have to mess it up. But have you ever done this? You get home from a day of work or from hanging out with family and you have have an amazing job. You come home, you treat your spouse really well, you're perfect to your kids or to your parents or whatever sort of family or living situation you're in. But then we get into this victim mentality after, where we're lying there in bed, or maybe it's on the drive to work the next day or some other place. We can have this thought process roll through our heads. And we are thinking about how maybe our boss is a jerk, or we're thinking about how our kids just aren't thankful enough for all we do for them, or the weather's too hot, or too cold, or life just sucks. If we are doing that, we are still missing the point. Because as Paul says, we're supposed to do all this while giving thanks through him, That's Jesus, that's the hymn there, to God the Father. So as we walk through our life doing all these good things, we are called to be thankful too. And I get it, it can be tough. There are days when it's just so tough. But here's some steps that I really find helpful for myself, and I'm going to share those, and you could throw them in the garbage, because these are just steps, but I find it helpful for helping me process through this stuff. So these are the following questions I ask myself. Number one, I ask, can I do anything about it? And if the answer is no, I can't do anything about it, then I ask myself, do I still want it to change? And if I still want to change it, then I pray about it. If not, then it's time to move on. It's that simple. If I can't change it, if I can't do anything about it, and when it comes down to it, I don't want to take any steps to do anything about it. I'm not even willing to talk to God about it. Then I just got to move on. Number two, or the question that you ask after that, if you can do something about it, do I want to? Because sometimes we crumble on and on about something. I know I do this, and then it comes down to it, and it's like, well, do I actually want to do something about this? No, I don't. So if I actually don't want to do something about it, then we got to stop grumbling about it. we got to stop focusing on it. And if I do want to do something about it, then let's do that. Maybe the boss is just treating you in an entirely non-respectful way. Then have a conversation, a respectful, measured conversation when you're calm. Or maybe, yeah, your kids, you do a lot for your kids and you think they need to think more about being thankful for the things in their lives. Well, then what can you do about it? Maybe talk to another parent who knows about, you know, maybe he's gone through the same thing or a more experienced parent who's older. If you can do something about it, then do it and stop grumbling about it. We can't let ourselves get stuck in this stage of grumbling about something that we don't even care enough to do anything about. And we can't grumble about something for so long when there's nothing that we want to do or either can do about it. Now, some of you may have an objection to this. And I recognize that exclusion, and I'm not talking about that exclusion, but I will mention it to because it's legitimate. And I call that mourning. It's different though. 
I have lost my father, my father-in-law. I watched my mother and mother-in-law mourn the death of their husbands, my grandma and grandpa mourn the death of their son, and I know so many of you have unique and painful experiences that call for genuine mourning. I can't fully understand your individual circumstances, but I firmly believe in the need for genuine mourning and release. But there's a difference between those situations that we genuinely need to appropriately mourn over and those things that are an everyday part of life that we need to let go of. I don't think I need to explain that difference in more detail, but that anyone who has mourned the loss of something or someone knows the difference. But also, when you're with someone else, you need to know that difference too if you haven't lost anyone or if you haven't lost anything that has required mourning. Know that these people, these individuals, are genuinely going through a mourning process. They're not grumbling, they're genuinely mourning. And we need to let them have that time. I spent a lot of time on this because it can really affect the light we show others. We can show all the love in the world, but if we go home and grumble about it to our spouse or friend, then we are missing the point. And not shining a light that those people who hear us are attracted to and it shows them that we aren't genuine in our care for them. God has been so good to us with the gift of grace, uh, of life, that we didn't deserve coming to us in the form of his son, Jesus. Even on those absolute garbage days where everything seems to go wrong, where we seem incredibly weak, as God told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Cling to him in those times when we feel weak and he will give you strength to get through. In this last part, I want to reiterate the importance of that city on a hill, that lighthouse beacon mentality, except beyond the church and how it looks for us as believers personally. I don't know if any of you have ever heard, well, actually, I know that some of you have heard of the Truman Show, um, but maybe not all of you have, and I'll explain a little bit about it. In the Truman Show, a man, it's a movie, a man named Truman lives his whole life as the main character in a TV show. People watch him from all over as he goes through his everyday life. They see how he acts in his marriage, what it's like for him to go to work, um, how he treats his friend, friends. His whole life is essentially under a microscope. But he doesn't even know it. That's the piece of this. He's just walking through life, um, and he was born in this TV set, this massive TV set that watches him his whole life, and he just thinks it's a normal town. It's a really cool idea for a show. And I'm sure most people, when they watch it, catch themselves wondering if it is true in their own life. I'm here to tell you it is true. But no, don't worry, I'm not sharing a conspiracy theory that we are all on a TV show. But I do believe that we are all being watched. And I'm not just referencing God, who does see all, which can be a great point to make, but that's not the point I want to make. Rather, the Truman Show is true in that every single person we interact with, all day, every day, is watching us. Whether you are at home with your spouse, or your spouse is gone but your neighbor knows what you are up to, or your kids are home, or your siblings, you have your boss, friends, the question is, are your actions bringing them closer to Christ or pushing them farther away? Does how we treat our spouse make them want to know Jesus more, or does it make them feel like the whole Christian thing may actually be a fraud because we can't be legit. When we interact with our boss, with our employee, do we look like someone different? A living, walking representation of Christ? Or are we just the same old person? Just the same as everyone else? (laughs) This strikes home for me. Because my dad didn't have much use for God growing up. But at school, my dad met someone. His teacher, who seemed so different from the other teachers, the way she acted was just not the same. She was a Christian. This could be pinpointed as the time that my dad began to take a more serious interest in faith in Christ. And my dad's journey took a while, and it changed over time. But over 20 years later, my dad was baptized. And I am so thankful for that teacher who let Christ change her every action. So teachers, people in authority over children, it matters how you treat these kids. And even though it may take years, it is so worth it to treat them with the grace of God.
Let that grace change your life. Let it make you different. My dad also let God change his heart and work on him and how he treated me. And I still remember as a middle school boy, I'm riding in the grain truck beside my dad. He's just dropped off some grain at another farmer's place. But I actually thought that my dad hadn't treated his farming friend right. So I told him that. Calmly, I informed him that he shouldn't have treated him this way, and he should have treated him this way instead. I'm not going to go into the details of what I confronted him on. Can you imagine? You're in your 40s, and your young whippersnapper 12-year-old son says to you that you have messed up, and has the audacity to tell you that you should have done it differently, and that you don't know how to properly talk to your friends. He could have reacted poorly. He could have told me off or interrupted me and informed me that I don't understand the situation, but he listened to it all and took it under consideration. He didn't give me any negative feedback about that. He just listened to me. He wanted to hear what I had to say. He wanted to know. What did that tell me as his son? It taught me that my opinion matters far more than him ever just telling me that it did. It told me I can challenge him, in private, whenever, because he will always listen. It told me that even when I disagree with something he did, I am still his son and loved. Now that doesn't 100% transfer over to God, because our Father up there, up there is perfect. Up there and in here. But it has always helped me to know that my Heavenly Father will, even better than my earthly father, always love me, always listen to me, and always desire to talk to me. One conversation where my dad could have gotten angry with me instead helped instill those values. I don't want parents to underestimate that. He didn't plan that conversation. He didn't ask for it. And I would say, if he had been a better friend beforehand, it would never have happened. And that's my, my perspective on it. But he used that time anyways. It is often in those moments, the person struggling, the angry teen, the upset spouse, the stone-cold store employee that woke up on the wrong side of the bed, or the boss who woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Situations like that define whether we are just nice people or whether we're genuinely letting Christ shape us into reacting to these situations in a Christ-like way. And let me tell you, I fail. I fail a lot. But just because I fail, it doesn't make those times that I like, <laughs> that I let Christ work through me any less good or less worth working towards. Just because perfection isn't achievable until we are fully sanctified, that is fully changed in heart and mind by Christ, it doesn't make any of our actions or words any less important. Each one affects those around us. Now, these are just two moments that have really gotten to me, that have really affected me, how I look at this. But I could easily collect more stories of other people affected by Christians who are living their lives in a way that shone like a light, that they were different. The point is to show that every interaction is an opportunity. Paul continues in Colossians 4, verse 5 to 6. This is a big jump here, but I really like this what he says here. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. This goes back to how I noted Rob's words. If you don't know, I'll repeat what those are. If you don't know where the book of Colossians is, at the beginning of your Bible, you got a table of contents. People worked hard to put it there. Just don't be ashamed to use it. Those words make the most of an opportunity. Some of you listening to this may not be familiar with the Bible or even with Jesus. And it just opens it up to say, hey, you don't need to have everything figured out. And it's frankly honest. I have to use the table of contents at times. Those minor prophets can really get to me. But Rob's words are filled with grace, and it immediately makes me feel like I can relax when he says them. This is how we want to introduce people to Christ. Not with judgment or what we falsely perceive as our privileged positions, but with grace. 
We have the privilege of being filled with the Holy Spirit and saved by Christ. But with it comes the responsibility of representing him, of being that light in other people's lives. We need to do that as a church, but also as individuals. Now you notice today that I didn't talk a lot about the nitty gritty moments, the, or like what those individual actions are. But go take a look at the Fruit of the Spirit. Go take a look at the Family Matters series. You know, we've talked about this at church time and time again. What I was trying to convince you today is that it's worth it. It's so worth it to do this. That how you act in your life, whether it's in this church, whether it's with people you meet on the street, it changes lives. And it might be like my dad. It might be way down the road where you might see fruit. There was fruit, you know, several years down the road. Or, but it wasn't super noticeable that he went from being a... He didn't turn from a teen who saw that teacher into being an elder at his church right away. It took time. He had a learning process that he went through. And that's what all these people are. You're not going to see fruit from every single action but it doesn't make any of those actions any less valuable. I've spoken a lot today. And as, but as Paul says, not I, but the Lord. And that's what I want to finish with. Not I, but the Lord. That is Christ has the following words in Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I'm just going to repeat that last line. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Thanks for joining us for church. We'd love to stay connected with you guys throughout the week. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can like us on Facebook, you can follow us on Instagram, or you can check out our news page on our website, which is pathwaycc.net slash news. And we're gonna have another guest speaker next week, which we're really excited about. So come check that out. You know where to find us.